it's like you know what you get in, what you get, what you, you put in, you get in, you get out, what you put in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Song twist that try saying that three times quick. <laughs> Sam, um, I've brought you here today because I think obviously with your role within the company, you're a lead strategist and I wanted to talk about how we actually go about planning strategies moving into the new year. I know that it's January now and we're already implementing what we've actually put in place, but I thought um, it'd be a good topic of conversation uh, to actually go through. Um, so personally, I think we start from actually researching and evaluating what's happened the year before. Um, and I think that's a, well, that is the, the best way to start. Try to identify content gaps with your clients and sort of work through what you've already done because you never need to reinvent the wheel. You just need to tweak it slightly. So, um, yeah, so what, what would you like to add to that at all? Yeah, no, <clears throat> I think you're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, the devil's in the details with looking at past results. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're looking at 2022 now, but obviously the results from 2021 will be telling, um, mm -hmm. particularly if you're working with, I mean, either your own business or you're working with clients like we are, mm -hmm. there should have been goals set for everything throughout the course of the year. So, you know, it's always good to look back retrospectively. You know, we look back sort of monthly, quarterly, mm -hmm. and then sort of yearly. Yep. Um, so, yeah, looking back at the goals, where all the goals hit? Mm -hmm. If they were, you know, from our point of view, is the client happy? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the growth ambitions for the year forward? I think it's, it's slightly easier for us and, um, and probably for more people in-house is that, you know, planning for a year ahead is a case of, you know, this is what we achieved this year. Mm -hmm. These are the goals that we hit. And then looking ahead, uh, you know, most companies will set goals for the year. They'll set revenue targets. Mm -hmm. They'll set, you know, employee number targets, all these things. And these can all be tied into the marketing, of, mm -hmm. you know, and, and broken down into different KPIs. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. First thing to do is to look back at what's been achieved. Yeah. Look at what you want to achieve over the next 12 months. And then obviously it's tailoring your market into that. And, you know, just like any big task, if you mm -hmm. break it down to the sum of its parts and you you look at that on a monthly basis yeah, rather yeah, than looking yeah. at it at a full yearly basis, you start making these little adjustments that can get you there. Of course. And that's obviously, that, that helps obviously the channel. So from a PPC perspective, um, I might run maybe two or three platforms and they, they all might have been a success. But at the same time, with these companies, if they're making money, they want to spend more money as well. So mm -hmm. then it'd be up to me to maybe identify a new platform. Mm -hmm. And then how would you go about that? And that's where I think the competitor analysis is essential. Because if you have got big players in the field, mm -hmm. um, there's multiple tools out there. SEMrush and if it's a PPC specific, you could look at the LinkedIn ads and mm -hmm. see what advertising they're running and sort of what content types are running. I think, for example, for me, um, one of our clients, we were, we were running quite a lot of the ads, they were very similar though, static images all the time, and they were performing well, but our competitor was always outperforming us. I think we, I looked into the, the competitor as well, and we noticed that they were just running a webinar instead, which is video content completely different to mm -hmm. what all the other competitors are doing. But there is a reason why these people are doing that. And I think, yeah, the, the research and sort of evaluating what's actually got on is so important into actually planning it. It's not just something that you come off what have we got planned for the year? You need to actually identify what your competitors are doing it mm -hmm. and then structure your year on that. So yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, and I think that moves on quite nicely into the actual developing of that strategy. So um, yeah, how would we go about developing these strategies? What's your, what's your sort of best? So I don't think there's like a one size fits all approach to mm -hmm. strategy. Everything is based on the individual client from our point of view um again going back to what the goals are for that year like you said you just mentioned then talking about what competitors are doing mm -hmm. you know that's one benchmarking statistic some people might be you know we want to compete with so and so mm -hmm. but obviously in some cases you may be the market leader it might be yeah. you want to defend your position you you know there's different motivations that people have for wanting to achieve what they do no company ever wants to achieve the same as they did the year before. So you could hit all the goals one year and, you know, if you turn around to a client and go, all right, same again next year, yeah. they're probably going to go, nah, we no, did that. Yeah. We did 7% growth last year. I want to do 10% growth mm -hmm. this year. So, you know, it's always progressive when you're doing these things. And it's, I think from our point of view, which, you know, it, it's being realistic about goals as well and sometimes having to rein clients in. And it's mm -hmm. one of those things where you have that conversation. You say, great, you want to grow an extra 3% on what you did last year. Yeah. However, we can't just do the same thing that we did last year. Course, you know, we yeah. have to do more. We have to potentially spend more on PPC, as you well know. Maybe mm -hmm. We have to look at more channels. We have to look at increasing our organic. You know, you increase all of, of these channels and you, you get that extra growth. It's, you know, when you look at it as an overview, as like a funnel, mm -hmm. it's quite simplistic. It's like, you know, what you get in, what you get, what you, you, know, you put in, you get in, you get out what you put in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Song twist to that, try saying that three times quick. Um, but yeah, so obviously when it comes to doing a strategy, it's based 
on that client on the things that you've done before that you know work so mm -hmm. you know as you you'll know as an example um we've had clients that have started doing google ads and then found it's just not the channel for them for yep. example you know either they don't have the budget to compete mm -hmm. or whatever it is but it doesn't mean that there's not a channel for them of course you know we've recently switched a client to linkedin ads and we've seen success from moving away from google to that obviously the different instantaneously yeah, yeah, yeah different intricacies there mm -hmm. but it's more about adjusting that strategy and finding what works doing more of that and then testing and continually optimizing yeah well i think um, a good point that you made is obviously if you're the market leader and you want to add on top of it a lot of people might think that right okay so this is what we've spent this is what we've gained we want to pretty much spend mm -hmm. spend more and we expect the same but without the testing at the starting point you're never actually going to get to that point without actually mm -hmm. sacrificing some budget as well so i think yeah i think that was a very good point because if you are a marketing leader you've got to be able to mm -hmm. spend more to then identify right okay mm -hmm. these are our platforms which competitors are using but what are we what are we actually going to be putting on and what do we need to test into the bidding budgets and i think yeah mm -hmm. i think that was a very good point that you made as well things get more expensive as well i mean if you're not increasing your budget you're actually decreasing it okay. essentially so like year on year if you say it's arbitrarily say someone says, oh, you've got a thousand pounds to spend mm -hmm. on PPC. And then the next year they come and say, you've got the same budget, I accept the same results. Not necessarily, no, you know, but even PPC, it's getting, well. it's getting more expensive. It's getting more competitive. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be, you know, as a client, as an agency or as an in-house market, be looking at how are we progressing our budget? How are we progressing the channels that we're using? Um, and it sort of leads into that point of, you know, not just doing things for the sake of it, either yeah. doing the things that work, mm -hmm. you know, Quite often we'll get clients who are like, oh, I really want to try, uh, I really want to try augmented reality, mm -hmm. let's say, which is great. And if you ever played with AR tech, it's cool. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but you, you haven't even done some simple video content yet. Of course, yeah. You know, oh, I want to do artificial intelligence. I want to do, and it's like, you've not even done any automation. It's that kind of sort of playing around with these things and mm -hmm. finding what works and then pushing that button until 100%. it really does what, you know. And it's a more holistic approach, isn't it? Like mm -hmm. you said, it's, you want to be on all of them little bits before you start experimenting with these new new technologies mm -hmm. which are coming out. There's so much more that you could already be doing, which guaranteed all your competitors are doing. And it's probably maybe one of the reasons why they're still seeing performance as well. So, yeah, no, I 100% yeah. agree. Because as soon as these new things come out, everyone mm -hmm. tries jumping on them as quick as possible. And in some cases, it works. I think it's the mm -hmm. same with TikTok, for example. Um, for PPC, you're seeing lots of people spending lots of money and they're getting great results, mm -hmm. but this will be a minority. There won't be the majority of people mm -hmm. who are getting on that platform. And obviously it's earlier on, so you can make a bigger imprint if you jump on straight away, but you're neglecting all the other things which have got you to where you are in to begin with. So I think that could do with more focus, like you said, and then mm -hmm. start to, if you're starting to see more budget, more time available, then start to look at these sorts of things as well. Yeah. Um, it's human nature though, isn't it? It's like, it's the, it's the big shiny thing that everyone wants to jump on. Every marketer wants to say, mm -hmm. I'm working with this or I'm doing that or I'm implementing this process. It's a bit and, more relevant at the time, you know, isn't it? Like you said. And, yeah. yeah, it's more exciting when you sat around having a drink and talking about work, yeah. but actually it's like, have you got the fundamentals right? Are you mm -hmm. are you doing the basics justice at this mm -hmm. point before you start jumping off and spending thousands and thousands? Well, that's and thousands it, and to pounds. some extent as well. Like, if it's that new, who does know best practice? Mm -hmm. Because it's maybe it's a bit more advantageous to wait to see how other companies have reacted on it, and then use what they've got and what yeah. insight they've gathered to try and pivot your strategy mm -hmm. on it. But I think there's a high risk if you jump in it straight away, and you are sort of mm -hmm. defining your own best practice by your own testing. But yeah. I think it's a tricky, um, yeah, it, it can be tough. I think it's one of the things that really bugs me about the, you know, the 2022 marketing trends list that mm. you look at. It really bugs me because the stuff that they put in there is always, you know, this unachievable. It applies to the one percent of companies, of the enterprise companies, and it's like this is the year you should be invested into augmented reality apps and da 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 da. da and it makes all these other companies feel like, why are we not putting budget there? And yeah. it's like, hold on, you're not there. You just got to, you yeah. know, actually a simple content strategy thinking through your social media strategy, mm -hmm. looking at how you can use email and automation best practices and getting into these things are where you are. And I think it's just that sort well, of at the end of the day, with marketing them blogs, terminology. They have to it? make it different from the year before. Yeah, of course so, they do. So like, they'll scour everything, mm -hmm. like you said, and they'll have all these new features, technologies that you should be doing. But like you said, if you, you've got the basics that you mm -hmm. can be doing each year anyway and just develop on yeah. them. But yeah, they cut that out because 
Mm -hmm. The search volume on them new ones, you can imagine mm -hmm. they're through the roof when they first come in, like AI and how it works and all this sort of stuff. So it makes sense for them mm -hmm. from a content strategy like you were just mentioning. If they're a blog who do 2022 trends, it mm -hmm. makes sense for them to like, right, to get the most clicks, let's talk about all this stuff. But it's yeah. not necessarily, like you said, it's not necessarily the right the right answer for small, uh, smaller businesses and medium-sized businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and I think lastly, we sort of touch on the sort of implementation of this strategy that we've devised. and and then moving forward the optimization on it. So for me anyway, I think the implementation, it's making sure that the assets that you've got, especially from um, a paid social standpoint, you've got a good variety. So we've got your single image, you've got your videos, you've just got a good variety in terms of, so you can A-B test, maybe your mm -hmm. images are slightly different and then you can start implementing it. You've obviously done your research, so you should know what sort of bidding you can be going in at, your budget, so what, um, going down that train of thought. But yeah, I think, um, the implementation is key like as long as especially from a ppc standpoint if you set it up from correctly and mm -hmm. very efficiently from the start the optimization is the easiest part after that because off your weeks of research and evaluating what you've done in your strategy to put together all these channels mm -hmm. you sort of just let it run at that point you've already done the hard work in terms of getting all the data together now it's just making sure that you've put it out in the best light as such yeah and i think it's you know it's implementation and <clears throat> experimentation it's something that is yeah, part of our culture definitely. here where we, you know always tweaking you're never fully happy with something there's always something you can you can try whether it's an a b test something else <clears throat> but obviously making sure you've got them and i think obviously mm -hmm. when we're talking about planning for the year it's planning in enough detail that you've got a, a solid roadmap to work to, pivot. but with enough pivot points and yeah. enough giving it that, you know, if your theory is invalidated at any point or you actually find something different through an experiment that you, mm -hmm. you know, you're willing to change things. Of course. So, I think that touches on one of the questions that we'll ask later, like you said, in terms of when you're planning your strategy, three, six, nine months, exactly mm -hmm. that, you, you could probably plan that on the long scale, but you mm -hmm. need to, like you said, you need to have had room to, if this has not been as effective as what we can be, you need to be reactive or proactive enough to be able to pivot around that uh, without actually it impacting the strategy that you've got in place. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, that, that extends to the goals that you set as well. I mean, obviously, part, a big part of campaign planning is setting out your goals and mm -hmm. then setting out how you're going to achieve those goals. We've had, you know, examples that can go both ways. You can have things that happen like COVID impacted, you know, probably everyone's marketing goals to an extent, mm -hmm. some positively, some negatively. You've got to be ready to revisit them at a certain points. So you could set 12 month goals and we quite regularly do. Mm -hmm. But a lot of things can happen in 12 months. There could be a lot of growth and you could say, yeah, you could sit there and keep patting yourself on the back and go, we're smashing these goals or mm -hmm. by like 200% every time. Mm -hmm. But actually what you really should be doing is going, look, those goals were great six months ago. Now they're not where we're at. Mm -hmm. We need to revisit them. We need to set some more ambitious goals. Or if you've had a negative downtrend, you know, COVID's impacted your business or whatever it might have been and you sort of hitting lower, yeah, you've maybe mm -hmm. also got to be prepared to go the other way and go, look, we weren't anticipating this, we maybe have to revisit these goals and start thinking about what's more achievable this year now that we know what we do know. So, you know, and that's, that is the same for everything. It's goal setting, it's for the channels that you're using, being ready to be flexible and agile, but also having a good plan and not just sort of throwing as much stuff against the yeah, wall to see what sticks. To some extent, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, and also we uh, we touched well. We asked about and got some some of the most relevant questions for the Q and A at the end. So I think Jonathan, are you all right to um, rattle them out, please, mate? Yeah, yeah, I've got your questions, but I mean, just I've got a question before mm -hmm. I uh, throw to those. Uh, you guys touched on it earlier about um, yeah marketing trends that come up, and clients will read these you know these fancy lists of what they should be pursuing. You said like augmented reality and things like that. How do you guys personally manage? clients expectations when it comes to things like that how do you decide mm -hmm. what clients should be pursuing these newfangled technologies mm -hmm. and which ones should actually just stick to the basics as you mentioned earlier yeah 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 it's a good it's a good question and obviously i don't mean to sort of shit all over these <laughs> other things they're obviously great tech there's a reason they're in all these lists um, I think for a lot of clients it's a question of budget they want to do the big shiny thing but they want to do it on the sort of the, the lowest budget possible, which, you know, that's an easier conversation because it's sort of saying, you know, mm -hmm. if you're willing to dedicate this amount of money to it, yeah, we'll we'll look into it. But at the budgets you're working out, we think you'd be better off spent here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, what we do is we demonstrate value as much as possible. You know, we set goals to things. So we may, we will literally show someone and say, look, mm -hmm. if you're willing to do this strategy, this is what we're estimating you can get. Whereas on this strategy, it's going to cost you X and you're going to get Y. And it becomes a really easy conversation at that point. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I, I think, um, like you touched on before, I think if, if you're a company that's heading to the end of the year and you're starting to sort of do this research and you've actually, you've, you've maxed out what you're currently yeah. doing, then start looking for these platforms. But if there's more that you can do, which, like you said, off the competitor mm -hmm. research, if there's more that you can identify that they're pivoting, mm -hmm. that is still probably worth focusing on rather than mm -hmm. jumping. But if you are this business, which is... Like I said, from a PPC standpoint, okay, you're on Google Ads, you're on Microsoft, you're on LinkedIn, you're on Twitter, mm -hmm. all of these platforms, your budgets are not an issue, then mm -hmm. you could probably start looking at these things. But I think, yeah, I think exactly like you said, I think you've got, once you start seeing how much budget mm -hmm. you need for these things, there's only a finite amount of companies which can actually jump on all of this all yeah. at once. And I think that's probably the best response in terms of, like you said, into what are the budgets that we're working on and what where can that best be spent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice, cool, that makes sense. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll throw the first question that came in. So it was, what data should you revisit when reflecting on marketing in order to plan for the following year? So um, I'll go from a, from my standpoint anyway again, but I feel like tools like your SEMrush, your uh, Google Keyword Planner, your sort of insight tools, your forecasting tools, and I think using them to identify the sort of the gaps in the market in terms of what sort of ads are they running, what are they not running um, from a content perspective, what content are they producing, what are they not producing and just sort of using this data from the entire 12 months, obviously in this case mm -hmm. with it being COVID, I, it's very difficult to, over the last two years, if someone tried to take 12 months and try to emulate that's what it's going to be moving forward, the chances are it's probably not going to be that. But I think using all these sort of tools to just try and collate what, you, what you're currently doing what are you missing? Um, and yeah, I think the tools are key in this in mm -hmm. this bit. Yeah, I think um, obviously from a slightly broader perspective, if you're looking like across channels, mm -hmm. there's so much. I mean, everyone knows there's so many marketing metrics. You can you could fill sheets and sheets and Excel sheets. You can have formulas all over and stuff. I think it's about cutting through to the story of that. So if you're looking at a year's mm. with the results, what is the story from that channel? So looking at everything overall. So. You know, we're big fans of tying everything back to revenue and having like actual ROI. So but obviously that starts with sessions. Yeah. So how's each channel performed in terms of sessions? It's done really well out of those channels. Which one's been generating contacts from those sessions? Great. MQLs. MQLs, exactly. SQLs. Yeah, 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 what was becoming opportunities? And you, you start to build up a very sort of compelling story that way. It's a bit because, more tangible as well, isn't it? If you yeah, can. exactly. Yeah. I mean, everyone for marketing, I mean, you can pull up so many metrics and there's so many vanity metrics as well, which, yeah, maybe look great, but actually most companies are bothered about the bottom line. What, what revenue did I generate from my marketing activities? What did I spend versus what did I realise? Mm -hmm. And I think if you can tell that story, um, yeah, absolutely. We want to talk about sessions. We want to talk about engagement on social media. All these things are really great to report on, but ultimately it comes down to well, you that's know, when you're going um, the bottom line. When you're assessing the specific mm -hmm. channel, that's when you'd start to look at their metrics. Yeah. But like from a company, like you said, from an overarching perspective, mm -hmm. it's money in the door. How much am I spending? But once you're like, right, we're going to focus on social. Mm -hmm. You will be looking at engagement rate. You mm -hmm. will be looking at CTR and these metrics, and they're important. But like you said, when you're looking at this overarching you want to cut down to what, as a business, mm -hmm. how much do we need to get an MQL or how many sessions, sorry, do we need to get an MQL, so on and so forth. Yeah, and knowing, down. knowing those conversion rates is so valuable. And this is what makes HubSpot like such a valuable tool in itself that everything ties back. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're using Marketing Hub and the Sales Hub and the Deals Pipeline and things like that, you can literally tie back like, all right, so last year we made X million, mm -hmm. and you can tie back every single thing to a source, and you know, you can literally see which parts of your marketing are working the hardest, which maybe need a bit more attention, mm -hmm. and which you maybe need to evaluate and think, you know, we're pouring a lot of money into that and it's not driving any revenue as such. Is there another value to it other than revenue? Sometimes mm -hmm. there is, sometimes it's like, you know, for social, for example, sometimes it's great for existing customers, you know, it's great as a customer support tool and things like that, but you can really have that picture built up of, of and it becomes really easy to report on then, you know, I mean, I've worked in jobs before, you, spend, you can spend months pulling together reports. Yeah. When you've got that kind of intelligence at your fingertips, it becomes a really easy report to create course, or really does, easy yeah. to look back for a year and make and justify each channel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Even being able to say you spend X on SEO and actually you drove X organic revenue, yeah. which gives you you know, like a three to one ratio or something like that is, is, is really powerful, course, especially for a client. Well, that's the numbers that they should be mm. seeing, especially yeah, yeah. the vanity metrics. 
Cool, I'm going to jump ahead of question because that rolls on quite nicely from Sam's point there. But this one's for you, Christian. Mm -hmm. Where should we be spending the budget? Um, what platforms should we be looking at this year? Um, so this year, I, I suppose, one, it depends on sort of what business you are to begin with. Um, but this year, and pretty much the majority of last year, we've been putting a lot more money into LinkedIn. Um, if you're a B2B business, I think, and you're using download pieces, I think LinkedIn lead gen, I think that is a very, very, use, it's, it's been a big success for a lot of our clients. Um, and yeah, I think, but at the same time, like I said, I think it touches back on what we were mentioning before. Have a look at what your competitors are using, and these are the reasons probably why they're successful. So even though I might be saying LinkedIn now, maybe you're, for your company, for example, it might be different. Um, so and also it depends on budgets as well. So you need to get a few things in order before you can actually start saying, right, that's my definitive platform. Because LinkedIn, you tend to want to be, you want at least a, a good hundred pound daily budget to be effective. It sort of opens you up to sort of a, a, a more unique audience on LinkedIn is how I was explained to it. You're sort of limited. If you've got a, a less than a hundred pound daily budget, you can only sort of get a certain part of that audience that you're trying to target, whereas you start upping it. So I think it's based on your competitor research and sort of what channels you've used before, what, what's worked before, then have a take a look at your budgets and see if you can get more out of that particular platform that's working really well for you. Or do you start to look at a new platform like LinkedIn if you're producing that sort of content? Um, and then test again and then you're going to have to go through a period maybe a month or two where you're going to have to test maybe it wasn't the right maybe the ad or um, the campaign that you actually run didn't uh, wasn't working as effective as it should but then you could obviously look into uh, potentially pivoting it a different mm -hmm. way if it was a single image try a video try a carousel these sorts of things i don't think there's a, a plat like a single platform that you'd recommend to everyone i think it's more of a case of what works for you and you're only going to do that by evaluating what's what's going on in the market what they're using um yeah checking how much budget you've got so you're competitive on that mm -hmm. because even if you've got a small budget for example you're not really going to get a full sort of insight into your impact on that platform because if you're not spending what is required then it, it the platform's not going to give you as mm -hmm. much as it should be as well so yeah i think it's um yeah I think I think for me with LinkedIn and obviously not understanding the tool just into the same depth of using it as you do, but mm. there's two criteria for whether I would suggest that to a client, and that is one, can we build out the audience that you want to target in yeah, there? Yeah, that's and a very good point. Usually when you're working with B2B companies and you can use job titles and industries and things like that, that's you can so. build a very well-defined audience, mm -hmm. which is great. So if you can do that, that's checkbox one. And checkbox two is does that client, is their product or service high value enough to justify, because like you said, it is a little bit more expensive, yeah. but actually if you're paying 50 pound a lead, but matter, yeah. one of those leads converts and it's hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of business, all of a sudden it looks like a really good ROI again. Does, yeah. So yeah, if you were selling something that's, you know, low value price points and you were looking at quantity rather than, you know, like a high value, it maybe isn't the platform because no. you're probably going to end up spending too much on it to, to drive profit. But yeah, if you're working with you're high value product services, then yeah, like you said, it's been great for a lot of the mm -hmm. clients that can sort of meet those two criteria. Of course. Um, another one actually um, that we're trying to push a bit more is AdRoll as well. So AdRoll is a, a remarketing platform. Um, and obviously, it, well, it pushes on not only on Google and your Microsoft, it also, also pushes it directly on your socials, your Facebook, Instagram as well. So it's a great platform to be able to centralize your remarketing because you see like remarketing campaigns on google display remarketing mm -hmm. remarketing campaigns on facebook instagram they're all on separate platforms it's very hard to start to actually see which ones are doing which and the impact all together where it's that sort of holistic approach again where i feel like with ad roll for me having that all in one dashboard the reporting uh, platform within ad roll is brilliant as well so having all that under one sort of roof it, it makes your decision making a, a lot more mm -hmm. um calculative uh, yeah, at that point, I think that that's another thing I'd recommend as well. Looking into. Cool, nice one. Um, this next question is for you, Sam. So, uh, should we plan a twelve, six, or three month strategy, or is it uh, is it not as simple as that? All of the above. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think I think the way that we do this works. Um, I think you should have a twelve month strategy. It doesn't have to be as specific as you know we've got every blog we're going to write in that 12 months, every email we're going to write and send every, but having a strategy for the year mm. is a good idea. Having like a sort of overarching strategy of, you know, this is where we are now, this is where we want to be. Mm -hmm. These are things that we want to look at in that time. These are activities that we want to do. So 
having a long-term plan is 100% recommended. Mm -hmm. You know, 12 months is a good amount of time to be looking at your 12-month goals, looking at your, you know, the things you want to achieve in the year, what are your objectives. So in that sense, yeah, you're doing a 12-month strategy. However, it's also really valuable to work in sort of three or six month sprint cycles. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might say, we've got the 12 month strategy, how do we get there? Right, well, we're gonna work quarterly and we're gonna do three month sprint cycles where we're gonna do three month campaign plans and we're gonna, you know, this is where we're gonna do the specifics around the content plan. Mm -hmm. So where we're gonna look at the emails we're gonna do, what we're gonna do in social media, what the themes we're the topics you wanna cover. So my advice would be to, yeah, set your long-term 12 month strategy. Mm -hmm. And then work in three or six month sprint cycles to sort of put the specifics to that and have a real campaign plan and sort mm -hmm. of working your goals on a monthly basis and a quarterly basis and how they're going to add up over the course of the year to achieve that. Yeah, I think like you said, I think um, understanding the themes and topics over them short periods. And mm -hmm. like you said, you might not have all the blogs wrote out for the entire year, mm -hmm. but if you have the overarching theme, it's very easy then from our perspective to actually get dug in and you, you can actually start... Mm -hmm. being proactive with it whether like you said you don't have to get to the specifics but ha knowing right okay we're going to target this part of your industry mm -hmm. over these three months i think that's very yeah. very beneficial from a sort of a, um, a specialist point of view because for me to understand that i know what sort of period i'm running mm -hmm. into the research that i do for that it's going to be the same in terms of looking at the entire part of that mm -hmm. industry so i feel like it doesn't put me back to stage one if all of a sudden, right, okay, we're after uh, month three, we're going into this one and all of a sudden uh, we know that we're targeting this, therefore further research. Whereas if I've got that sort of planning ahead, mm -hmm. I can have already done my research before and I know markets change, so you we refresh up on it. But I feel, yeah, I feel like having them overarching topics and what you're trying to hit in general, I think, yeah, that's very useful from a, a three and a 12 month basis. Yeah, and I mean, that approach also, we talked about it before, staying a little bit flexible, mm -hmm. you know, you, it's good to have your 12 month vision, but when you're working in three month cycles or six months, you can you can change tact, you can have those pivot points in that. Whereas if you've got a rigid 12 month plan, then you, you, the worry would be that you blindly follow that out regardless of what the results what are telling you. It, yeah. So at least, you know, by doing the sprint cycles, you are encouraged to look back retrospectively on mm -hmm. every quarter and, yeah. you know, how did that work? Well, actually, we didn't get the results that we expected to, which means we're going to have to do something in Q2 to that's going to help to make up for it if we want yeah. to achieve the 12 month goals. Rather than just signing it and yeah, leaving it. <laughs> exactly. I mean, particularly if you're working in houseware, maybe, obviously, we have to report that to clients. That's not that's a given you know they, they're paying the money they want to know the results whereas in-house i think my experience of it sometimes is that people just carry on doing things and no one's really asking how things are, are necessarily working you know so it's like not the everywhere the meetings but, done the yeah yeah exactly yeah so yeah cool i mean to follow on to that then so how would you adapt those strategies if something drastic popped up like another lockdown or uh, a covid 3.0 <laughs> I mean, we've just been through this, so it should be an easy one to answer, really. I think in, there was two, I mean, using COVID as an example, um, there was two types of clients that I noticed. There were some clients who sort of wanted to batten down the hatches and survive. Mm -hmm. um, and they were the ones that, you know, maybe reduced budget with us or, you know, reduced their marketing teams and different things. And mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, there's a famous saying that like turning off marketing to save money is like turning off a clock to save time. And I would agree with that sort of philosophy. And so there was those clients that did that. And I never advised any client to do that. It was kind of, I mean, arguably you'd say, well, you would say that way, you want me to keep paying. But I think the clients that actually sort of didn't double down, but carried on the course, were the ones that saw the better returns when mm -hmm. things started to go back to normal. Back they were in a better yeah. position. They hadn't dropped loads of organic rankings because they'd turned off their SEO efforts and the content efforts. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they, they'd maintained the position and maybe it was slightly painful at the time, but I think there's a lot to be said for sort of head down, push on. Doesn't mean you couldn't adapt the channels and the mm -hmm. tactics you use and things like that and be ready to sort of pivot based on those mm -hmm. channels. But I think not turning stuff off is is probably you know the way forward in that respect no I, I i can vouch for that as well i feel from a ppc standpoint again i think um the businesses that actually continue to spend during that they actually started to dominate more of the market mm -hmm. and then you'd find that when actually we we started to open up a bit more they were already sort of eating up all the search volume so all the sort of revenue were going to these sorts of businesses obviously then you, these other ones can start competing again but i think mm -hmm. the brand awareness aspect through these periods as well just actually being visible mm -hmm. um i feel like it's so important like and yeah i just feel like the ones that went through mm -hmm. 
keeping on spending. I feel like it had such a big benefit coming out of it as mm -hmm. well. But like you said, it's very easy for us to say, but that's just what the data actually showed for these yeah. accounts. Um, but yeah, no, I tend to agree with that. And obviously there's, I mean, there's practical things as well. I mean, it's hard to say what the practical thing would be without having the scenario put in front of you. But like, again, using COVID as an example, you know, businesses that weren't as traditionally digital, for example, maybe for them, the tactic was to find a way to operate without course, yeah. relying on, you know, the brick and mortar stores and things mm -hmm. like that as much. So, you know, there's some businesses that had to pivot into that. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, most of our clients are using digital to some respect, but they had to change their processes, some of them, you know, they had to figure out ways that they could still service the customers mm -hmm. while staying, you know, as far away as possible yeah. and, you know, how to work remotely. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different things and there was a lot of channels that worked better during that time. So, oh, you know, we're going to touch on that. So yeah, yeah, like switching to, you know, emailing, staying in touch. People wanted to hear from the, mm. the businesses that they buy from at that time. They wanted to be reassured that services could continue as normal. They wanted to know what was going on and what the business was doing mm. to ensure, you know, that they could operate through COVID safely. So, you know, things like blogging and emails and social were really important tools then. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I suppose it's, you know, being flexible enough that if a situation is thrown up that you will analyze, you will look at what can work, what mm -hmm. you need to do and not being too afraid to change things is, yep. is probably the key thing there. I mean, one of the most dangerous things anyone can do is, you know, we've always done it this way and what works one year might not work. Yeah, next. exactly. So yeah, just, just again, staying flexible, mm -hmm. um, constantly monitoring the channels you're using and being ready to sort of change as and when is needed. 100%. Yeah. And I think like touching on um, just what you said there about the budgets, I feel like if something like that does come around again, being more hands on, you've identified, like you said, you've identified which channels were successful, which ones weren't. It doesn't mean that you want to turn them off, but potentially you can try and feed the ones which are doing a bit mm -hmm. more for you. But like you said, you don't want that mentality of just cutting it off. I just feel like mm -hmm. you are going to be more hands on. You're going to be more proactive. You're just going to be pushing more uh, money to what's actually working for you rather than the uh, um, the aspect of, right, we're just going to pause and save the budgets because, like you said, that's not going to be mm -hmm. healthy. You might survive now, but three to six months, it's going to be the exact same story. Mm -hmm. um, and you've just delayed it as such rather than t dealing with it head on. Cool. I've got one final question from me uh, that would be quite interested to know. Mm -hmm. So obviously we're filming this sort of towards the end of January 2022. When you guys were looking at your strategies for this year, but you know, back just only a few weeks ago, hmm. has anything come up already that surprised you or shocked you or that hasn't gone to plan in the, these first few weeks? Mm, I think it's different for every client. I think mm. um, early signs for the year and obviously things that I'm reading, and I'm, I'm not just sort of pulling this out of thin air, is that consumer confidence is going to dip a little bit, which makes sense when you think, you know, inflation's risen by 5%, five, um, six, which I think is the highest for 30 years. So mm. these are like things that you'd look at as leading indicators. And if you are a client that, for example, is working in like a B2C environment, which mm. we do have some, you maybe got to be prepared for those situations. And I know I have one client who's been quite reliant on organic for the last few years, which made sense. It was working really well. Um, he's probably thinking maybe of moving back into paid a bit this year, just mm -hmm. because they're anticipating a bit of a downtrend. Mm -hmm. Obviously that, you know, if you don't want to sort of lose that, you've got to think of other channels that you can implement that'll help you, you know, fill that gap. Of course. Um, so yeah, that's one thing that I'd, I'd maybe anticipate for the year. And I think we've seen early signs of with some clients, but it's still very early in the year, obviously, mm. and you know there's still things that would validate or invalidate that theory. Yeah, I think for me, um, like for me, I'm actually still in the process of getting things out at the moment and getting them live. So I feel like that, like, I'm, it's too early for me to actually comment from a PPC perspective. But as soon as it's more of a case of right now, we're working on actually getting the assets in place, getting the campaigns live. But as soon as they're live, I'm seeing early set like. Yesterday we just put a, an account live and we're already seeing unbelievable results. We've set, we, we put a planning hub in place. We wanted to deliver the goals and PPC was a big part of that, but we just couldn't, we, we were just struggling getting it live anyway. But now that we're live, we're seeing results are right where we want them. And all of a sudden our year is beginning with that client. So I think that maybe little teething issues might come up in the start of January, especially when people come back from holidays, you've got a backlog of work. They've got all sorts of these different um, bits to be doing, but as soon as you're sort of getting past this bit, that's like the reward is there essentially. But yeah, I think that we need a bit more time to actually analyze 
how effective uh, we've been at the start of the year. But I think, yeah, there's just a bit of teething issues after the, everyone's had a good Christmas holiday. Everyone's been relaxing. Everyone's mm -hmm. not looked at emails. Or some sad odds I've had anyway. But um, yeah, I feel like um, January is a bit of a unique month for these years. I always find that it tends to bring a bit of the poorer performance for a lot of companies for the 12 months anyway, because everyone's just getting back into the role of things for the year to come. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely true. It's one of those. I'm I'm quite excited to get into February yeah. and just get into the normal marketing year because even when you look at goal setting, you know, we obviously account for things like seasonal trends and we account for dips in Christmas. It's mm. going to happen, especially with B two B clients. Obviously, if you're working with a B two C toy retailer, they're probably going to increase. Yeah, but you know, we we account for these things based on past trends, and you know, one thing we see is that January definitely continues into that for a lot of these clients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's you maybe forget about it when you goal set and you think, oh, well, December's going to be a bit of a dip. But we should people, people are slower back to work, you they know. I mean, we, we're back in on, like, the 4th or something, but some people don't go back into work until sort of mid-Jan. And of depending on the business and the industry, it, mm -hmm. it just feels like it takes everyone a while to get going 100%, again. 100%, yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, that's all the questions answered. Unless you guys have anything else to add, I think that's uh, that's all. No, yeah, I think I, I'm I, sick I, of the sound of my own voice. Yeah, no, I'm happy <laughs> with that. No, that's brilliant. <laughs>